like to introduce our marquee uh, figure for tonight, uh, Bob Green. It's uh, <clears throat> a matter of uh, common accord among students to know that it, it's an easy thing to communicate panic uh, about tests and scores in colleges at this time, uh, but imparting uh, in students a, sen a sense of wonder uh, is a totally different proposition. <clears throat> Bob's teaching overflows from uh, a childlike sense of wonder, and that's a wonder that he has always uh, had uh, about the craft that he finds uh, wherever he turns. Bob uh, himself is a craftsman of wood and a craftsman of language, and under his eye, uh, nature uh, writes uh, of its own craftswomanship. So, a little, it's, it's a little, uh, it's a little, little surprise that Bob is himself a prolific writer about nature. And uh, as one can glean from uh, his wonderful book, Talking to Myself, uh, Bob uh, asks that we uh, stop to listen to streams and to emptiness and to watch turtles and worms and walk among puddles and currents. Since his arrival here in 1982, Bob has always made writing and creativity uh, his concern. And uh, in his uh, teaching, uh, the boundaries between individual and the biological world uh, are quickly dissolve. Uh, Bob has always taken kids to what's closest around them as a coach of track and cross country, a wilderness guide and a whitewater guide. He has also brought together the writings uh, of his own students in a published biology volume, Dissecting the Moment. If uh, Bob were uh, born, and I confess that I made this observation um, a few years ago when Bob was also here, uh, were Bob born 150 years ago, uh, he would not have any profession at all. He would simply be a character. Um, he'd, be, he'd be a transcendentalist um, because uh, he simply does a, a catalog of things. Uh, he, he, he runs, um, or he, he doesn't run right now uh, as he recovers his knees, uh, but he will be running soon. Uh, he writes, uh, he hitchhiked, hitchhiked across Europe, um, he has dug his own septic system, he restores uh, houses and sailboats, and uh, he uh, has also eaten porcupine, <laughs> as I'm aware. Uh, Bob has two stories to share, and the first is about a teacher who studies uh, a simple chess move and a whitewater uh, canoe maneuver. And in the second one, uh, he glances at a street musician and sees the world in a, in a new way. Thanks, Bob. I have two stories. The first is, touch the river lightly. Uh, Richard moved his white pawn E2 to E4. Uh, so this is what teaching is like, I remember thinking. Labor impossibly hard for 10 months, then recuperate all summer. I loved it. I took in my surroundings a watercolor begging to be captured to paper. Washington Square in full bloom, every variety of person imaginable strolling across the park, the arch framing Fifth Avenue. At neighboring boards in this shaded little section of the square, chess matches took two forms. Those in a rush briskly slid pieces to squares then slapped a timer, while others, like the one I was engaged in, followed a more leisurely pace. 
heavy on contemplation and conversation. Richard sat across from me, his mind apparently lighting on everything but the game. I moved my black pawn from E7 to E5. Um, Richard was close to retirement and seemed to have informally taken me on as a project. Tell me about your best class this year, he said. Richard, white knight, G1 to F3. That was easy. I had prepared well for this one. A demonstration of photosynthesis. Circular chads were punched from heavily pigmented uh, leaf resting at the bottom of a beaker filled with water. I had set a camera in place, and the setup filled the screen at the front of the room. A bright light shined on the chads, and as photosynthesis occurred, minuscule waste oxygen bubbles collected on each. I had chosen some subtle background music. Ever so slowly, a circle of leaf tipped up on its edge. More bubbles collected, and one chad after another released its hold on the bottom of the beaker and drifted majestically to the surface. All the while, my lecture wove in and around the rolls of the pigments, the light, the oxygen. It all just came together, I said to Richard. I moved my knight B8 to C6. J'ai double, Richard said as he reached out and shifted the position of his knight. So what did the kids think of your lecture? Wait, what? I said, you, you can't touch a piece without playing it. Richard looked up. J'ai dub, French really, it's I dub. You know, like a, a king dubbing a knight. He touches the warrior on the shoulder with a sword, forever altering this person's life. But in chess it means I adjust basically straightening a crooked piece while not playing it. He reached to the board again, uh, white bishop to F, uh, F1 to C4. Um, the kids, he repeated, what did they think of your lecture? Well, class ended and off they went, but I'm sure it made an impression. You can, you can sense these things. <laughs> I slid my black pawn from D7 to D6. I had a good student about 15 years ago. His name was Tom, Richard said. Excellent distance runner, too. I coached him. Uh, he was running with the pack one day. I was a few strides in front of them. Apparently, for no reason I can recall, I turned and caught his eye. Had you mentioned that to me 10 minutes later, I would not have remembered the interaction. And yet, I prompted. Well. <laughs> I saw Tom a couple of years ago. Told, he told me about the incident. He'd been showing off to the guys, talking tough, using foul language. Honestly, I don't recall hearing anything, uh, but he thought I had. He said I looked disappointed. He said that right then, he promised himself he'd never use language that would embarrass him should people he respected hear him. Um, he said he'd strayed now and then, but mostly he stuck to it. Richard, white knight, B1 to C3. What am I missing here, Richard? Oh, nothing. I'm just rambling, he said. I moved my bishop, C8 to G4. Funny, I asked Tom what my favorite lesson had been. Um, and he said he couldn't recall any. Humbling, I said. I'll say, he said. <laughs> Richard, white knight, F3, took my pawn at E5. Uh, we were quiet for a while. Then Richard started talking about another student he had had. I liked Sarah. Must have been 40 years ago now. Solid student. She joined my whitewater canoe team, and like so many newcomers, she fought the water. Aimed straight up river, she would paddle like mad. We were working on a ferry maneuver in which the canoe is directed against the flow of the water, maintaining an appropriate angle. The canoe drifts across the river without too much backsliding. I was having Sarah ferry across about 30 feet of water um, and tuck into an eddy formed by a partially submerged boulder. Water rushed to either side, water rushed to either side of the boulder, but directly behind it, the resulting upstream current was gentle and calm. 
Richard's attack on my pawn had left his queen open. I moved my g4 bishop to d1 and removed the white queen from the board. Richard seemed not to notice. Sarah paddled furiously, he continued. She was aimed almost straight up river, so it was her against the powerful current. With almost no sideways prog progress toward the eddy to show for her efforts, when finally her canoe crossed the eddy line, her next forceful forward stroke met no resistance and she smacked her bow into the boulder. She slapped her paddle across the gunnels, glared up river. Sarah was angry with the river, with the canoe, with me, with the world. I gave her some time, then ferried my canoe to join her in the eddy. I quit, she said before I could open my mouth. I'm done. Okay, I said, that's your call. Um, just for the hell of it though, watch what I do to get back to shore. Um, think of touching the water to make slight adjustments that will take you where you want to go. I eased up river, passed the boulder, across the eddy line, leaned slightly, and lightly touched the water a few times with my paddle. The river, in response, guided my craft gently to the shore. Richard barely looked at the board as he moved his bishop c4 to, c7, to f7. Check, he said. Uh, Sarah pouted for a while, he continued. <laughs> then he gave in, she gave in to her predicament, reluctantly leaned and touched the river's current just so. She drifted effortlessly to the riverbank. That was 40 years ago. We're still in touch on Facebook. She says she loves taking her husband and kids out canoeing. I asked her once if she, if she still recalled any of my lectures. Did she, I finally asked. I advanced my king e to e7, removing myself from check. No, said Richard. He slid his knight c3 to d5, checkmate, he said. <laughs> it's hard to believe that conversation with Richard occurred over 40 years ago. Hard to believe I'm on the brink of retirement. Hard to believe I'm here in Washington Square playing chess with Josh, a new teacher, keeping an eye on him. He shows promise. You've been teaching for a while, Josh says. Um, you ever consider some, listing some rules or guidelines or observations, something to summarize what you've discovered about teaching? Yes, I had, I thought. Of course, I made a list, 10 lists filled a journal with ideas. But when I read these things later, they were hollow, they were trite, shallow. So I edited, chopped, merged, and finally got the list down to just two items, two. And here's the thing, I wasn't gonna tell Josh. <laughs> they're, they're too simple. They appear on their face a letdown. And actually, they're not rules for being a good teacher. They're rules for not being a bad one. Uh, if taken to heart, good can emerge from it. I am still working on that one. Uh, the first, do no harm. A kid enters your class with a love of writing and leaves hating it. You've done harm. The second, it's not about you. I can impress the hell out of the kids by describing molecule by molecule a complex metabolic pathway. What do they walk away with? That I know a lot of big words. No, I'm not gonna tell Josh. Not directly. Not so he'd notice right away. Tell me about your best class this year, I said. Um, I reached to the board to adjust a piece, then looked Josh in the eye. J'ai a doux, I said. <laughs> This is called To See Beneath the Surface. Stationed at the entrance to a side street, the guitarist's fingers play upon the strings as a spider caressing its web. Thank you. He stands stock still, his essence elsewhere. He exists all but unnoticed by the crowd. 
few listen. Most brush past him, sloshing plastic cups, foaming beer, because their immediate goal lies behind this man. Bright blue plastic portable bathrooms, perhaps a hundred of them, line the curbs of this little side street. This fair draws thousands to view the creations of artisans from across the country and strategically place musical groups vibrate or assault the air. His headband, a rag actually, binds his wiry hair. Jimi Hendrix, acrylic on velvet. A faint breeze ripples his cheap, gauzy outfit, causing him to appear inconsequential. Some vague, ill-defined ghost, a mirage wavering above the baking pavement. The guitarist's head is tilted back and his eyes are closed, though he may be regarding the crowd through his eyelashes. Maybe he sees them coming. They move as a raucous cancer through this crowd, beer and elbows, black boots, tattoos, studs, piercings, attitude. His gaunt, scarred face speaks of a hard life, drugs perhaps, hunger, violence. From his fingers, though, drifts the most delicate music. It's the emanations of a mind content, brilliant, relaxed and pondering, searching. Notes and pauses, freed, flow within the very air as pastel reflections of fluttering petals on an undulating surface of a peaceful pond. The punks hesitate and eye the musician, easy prey. The soft chords continue floating quietly into the day, but the thugs seem oblivious to subtlety, to things of value or depth. They're so easy to despise as a group, as a type instantly. Driven by beer though, they grudgingly push past the guitar player in a single-minded rush to the porta -gens. One particularly surly youth, however, stands tattoos, tattooed arms folded, feet apart, glaring, belligerent. Can he not just leave the musician unscathed? Must he victimize a delicate soul who had done no harm, who had weathered storms, yet who freely shares his music with strangers? The music continues for another minute, gently washing the minds of the few who have paused to listen. With the last fragile notes, onlookers scurry away. None wish to witness this smirking youth and the ugliness poised to ensue. The musician remains a skeletal statue. His eyes remain closed. His hand, the spider, is poised upon the threads. The rash creature steps forward, heavy arms crossed upon his chest. For a fleeting instant, the musician's eyes flicker open to regard not the punk, but me. It's as if they read my soul. They see beneath my surface. They convey sadness. I am instantly adrift. It was so fast. Did it ever happen? The punk looks the musician over. His head tilts first one way, then the other. His face settles inches from the musicians. Bach, the youth in black leather and boots and tattoos and spikes and piercings, says quietly, respectfully, Bach, he repeats, the sheep may safely graze. Good boy, replies the street musician, eyes still closed. Good boy. I want to thank uh, the faculty uh, for uh, joining us tonight, I, I would love to uh, thank uh, Head of Upper School Noel Doherty for joining us and, and most especially our guests uh, from f uh, afar and near and, uh, and also, most of all our students. Thank you very much and uh, continue to enjoy. Thanks very much.